Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you've joined us uh, from wherever you are. I, we see you joining us from around the world at goodlifetelevision.org where you can see all these great interviews, great people, overcomers, entrepreneurs, ministers, public servants, basketball players, just about everything. And we got a great one today. You can also find power clips at goodlifetelevision.org where we see some of those great moments. We break them up into power clips and, and of course, all the social media platforms. We'd love to have you follow us there. But good life is about the good stuff, and we're here to encourage, to inspire, to empower. And, and, and one of the things about this program is it's authentic. It's, it's good life, but not like in this glossy, there's no problems, there's no struggles kind of way. It's like, what's the real good stuff? Which can happen oftentimes in the midst of suffering, difficulty, pain that we all experience. So that's what good life is all about. Buckle up, because today we have the great... And I really mean that. Uh, Pastor Chuck Reed is with me. Pastor, welcome. I'm going to write you a you check right autograph? now for the great. Yeah. <laughs> Chuck and Thank I you, uh, have known each other a little while. I was uh, fortunate enough to be a guest on his television program, which was an absolute ball. We had a great time. And, uh, and we will today as well. Uh, I want to start with where you started. Um, no place to start like the beginning. Mm -hmm. You're raised in, in a middle class home in Watts, went to Amos Memorial Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. They had you teach in Sunday school and you're actually ordained at 17 years old uh, and working with the youth. Talk a little bit about your ministry road and, and what it's been like all these years being called the ministry. And I know it hasn't been about the title for you, but it's been about ministry. You know, talk about that. Well, I, um, I'm, I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy, um, and like like any other person in life, you once you start experiencing life, you learn from it. You know, we can read a textbook, but until you get into the machine shop and build it and put it on the track and make it run, then you see what it does. And that's how life was for me. And at that age of 17, you know, I thought I knew everything, and life happened, and I had to make some choices. Which way are you gonna go, Doc? Yeah. You know, right. which way are you gonna go? Right. And I made some choices. And I, I want to say I made some choices. <laughs> but we know how it is when we yeah. say I. But, right, right, right. And that's I mean. you have to make choices in life. So you're called to Santa Barbara your first Sunday at church mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a minister there. Wow. You took a walk and you ended up in a park mm -hmm. and there was a homeless person. Mm -hmm. And you said that that kind of had an impact on your perspective mm -hmm. in terms of if I'm up you know, in this pulpit doing this, I need to do that. Yes, yes. But talk a little bit about... Because you've had a heart for the homeless, you've worked with people on the streets, but talk talk about how the heart change maybe that occurred. Um, I, and I, I think I, I, it wasn't so much. It, it is a progression, but that moment in Santa Barbara as a as a new pastor, kind of grounded my eyes to what I needed to do here locally, right? Yeah. Not just globally, but just locally. As a new pastor in town, I'm nervous for Sunday. I don't know what to do. I'm nervous. I'm crazy. I think my sermons, you know, you write, you're a pastor. You write a sermon, and you look at it like, and, and you guess it. And so that's why I was nervous. So I have to take my morning walk, and I walk my, a block down um, from where we're parked at, uh, the church was at, State Street, up State Street, to a little park. And as I'm walking through this park, I see two guys in the corner, it's 8 o'clock in the morning or so, and I see one guy, he's tied off, and the other guy is, pow, hitting him. And I'm like, wow, how can I pastor a church less than two golf ball swings away from where guys are shooting up moments before I open up the pulpit? Yeah. It's like, dude, you cannot. You have to address that issue before you can ever walk and talk to these fine dressed folks with their hats and their suits and their ties and their Bibles. Right. Talk to the guys with the needles. Yeah. Dude, that could be me. It could be us. It could right. be anybody. Right. Some anybody's son, anybody's kid. Right. Talk to that dude. And that's that's really what what switched me up for ministry. And how do you I mean in your work with the homeless and your work with maybe a drug addict or just somebody who's just on the street cho choosing that or not choosing that, whatever. Mm -hmm. What do you say? Like, when you, when you walk up, what do you, what do you, how do you handle it? I, I do just what you're doing. You sit down and you talk to them. Hey, bro. Hey, friend. My name is Dean. What's your name? <laughs> and that's where it starts. 
My name is Jesus. You're the lady by the well. Well, I'm not supposed to talk to you. Surely, we shouldn't be communicating. Surely. But as a sister, as a brother, I can't look at that. I got like this, come on. Yeah. Guy on the side of the road, you know, the preacher looked at him. Right. The rabbis looked at him. The church folks looked at him. That biker dude got off his ride. His hog jumped out and helped him. So, what, you know, what is ministry? Who was the minister? Yeah. Yeah. Cameraman, he's doing the TV ministry. Yeah. Bless me with the technical skills. Hey, Chuck, you got to plug the thing in before you try to turn the camera on. Oh, right. dude. It's a ministry, technical ministry. Yeah. We all have a part. It's a part. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we can't do it without each other. You know, I mean, it's interesting that when you, that they call it a body because, you know, <laughs> the pinky's overlooked. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. you get a toothache, it's yeah. game time. It's yeah. game over yeah. until that's fixed. Like yeah. every part of the body matters and every part works together yes. to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. And that's such an interesting. Very vital. Yes. Yeah. You can't discount it. Right. Discount it. Um <laughs> So one Sunday, I was feeling real good about myself. And I'm getting ready for church. Me and the wife are getting ready. And normally, this is a good Sunday because normally she's late. <laughs> she's early. She's ready to go to the... And as I'm getting ready for church, I stub my toe. Oh. Ooh, you know, that little... That, that, yeah. You know, 2% of the... 1% of the flesh on my entire body. Right. And I can't even preach. <laughs> well, the, word, the, the word of the Lord has gone. Yeah. I, I, I said, that. God... You know what I mean? So our flesh, man, is so, you know, it's so, man. I play guitar and I cut my finger. It took me almost two years before I could get to that, before I could hit it again. Because that flesh, I had to learn how to play like this. Right. Because my flesh, my, so weak, we're so weak. You know, and in the body, sticking with the analogy, if one part hurts... Is hurting the whole the whole yes. part the whole body cares the yes. whole body responds yes. the whole we should should if you feel the pain should yeah right if you, if you tie it off and you don't feel it you put a tourniquet on and you don't right, feel, you right, tie right. it off like those guys shooting that poison if right. you tie off your poison yeah you don't feel it right that's a yeah, beautiful flowers I cut one off but I still have beautiful flowers but that that cute one's gone yeah that that beloved one's gone isn't that interesting what yeah. gets you up in the morning. What gets me up? Yep. Well, the morning starts about 12 or 1. <laughs> and so I'm always late for the day. Yeah, <laughs> so about 3 or 4 o'clock uh, in the morning, you know, the Lord will tap me on the shoulder and say, boy, you better get running. You're three hours late. <laughs> you wasted. You wasted three hours. Think of, think of, think of that every day. If you, if you could, you had to look at the Lord and say, look, I, the first, because I slept till eight, nine, ten o'clock in the morning, Lord, I just wasted eight hours of your day. So you're an early riser. You have to be. Satan is. He's, he's up at, at 12.06, waiting for that party to be over that I used to hang out. He's waiting for that party to hang up. Oh, it's the mid witching hour. Cinderella's coming home. This catcher. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I remember wa watching so many of our young sisters walking home at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning looking so vulnerable. Satan's up waiting for them, crawling. Yeah, not a lot of good stuff's happening at that hour. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if the Lord blesses me to wake up at 3 or 4 or 5 in the morning, thank you. Yeah. I get to see that day. Yeah. Oh, so and you've worked as a police chaplain. Yes. And that, is, is that the same thing as a community liaison officer or are those different things? Uh, they, they migrated into one. They, they, okay. kind of, they migrated. I think it was something, uh, sometimes you don't, the position is made for you. Okay. And that's okay. kind of what it was. They saw the work. So <laughs> when people can't beat you, they join you. The PD couldn't beat me, so they joined me. Got it. Let's, we joined. see what he's doing on the street. Yeah. He is in the corner. Well, hey, dude, we got the perfect job for you. I said, yeah, I know. You should be doing it. <laughs> instead, of, instead of arresting some of these people, and that's, it's not a criminal. That dude is broken. A crackhead is not a criminal until he commits a crime. Skateboarding is not a crime unless you do it in, on, on the mayor's steps. 
right. and you run over the, the mayor's toe, then it's a crime because that's an injury. So, you know, how do you look at it? So, I don't know. It is systemically, in terms of how we deal with drug addicts, mm -hmm. what needs to change? Or, or what's what the best it, approach? What, what if it was your mother that was a drug addict? That's right. Right. How would you want to do that? <laughs> right? So how do you deal with that drug addict? Ah, that's my mama. And so how does that mama deal with the child? And my baby. Start there. I do this thing with my swim team. I have a little baby doll. And every once in a while, I throw the baby in the pool. And I start counting. I said, I don't care what you're doing in life. You better stop and see the baby in the pool. I don't care how many laps you got to do. You better see the Oh, lap. You swam by the baby? Extra push-ups for you. So we have to take care of one another. Yeah. And, you have to, see, you have to see the need. And the answer is just incarcerating oh, doesn't. Yeah. Uh, so there are, <clears throat> I'm gonna, and this, is, this will be, this will be cool, be cool, but there are bugs you squash, and there are bugs you need. There comes a time in life where I don't make the decisions, but I wish I could. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wish I, oh, swat that bad guy. Uh, he did a horrible thing. Mm. That's, yeah. I will. And then sometimes, I, yeah, yeah, and you made a bad mistake, Doc. You know, you made a mistake. Can, can you fix? Oh, I'm, 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 I'm gonna fix that. I, I'm, I'll spend the rest of my life correcting that. Yeah. You know. Right. The heart. What, what you gonna do? Right. What you gonna do? I was offered. What you gonna do, Chuck? A cop said, Chuck, "What you gonna do with your life?" At the end of every practice, get out of here. Do something with your life. That's what a cop, do something with your life. So at, the, at the end of every swim team practice, get out the pool, go home. Do something with your life. Mm. Get a job, do some, finish school, do some push-ups, tell your parents you love them. Mm. Make them think. And that drug addict, that homeless person, that preacher, he just needs somebody to sit by him and say, man, you're all right. Yeah, you're all right, you ain't perfect. I, say, I know you're not perfect. Show me a perfect preacher. <laughs> Right? right, I've never seen one. Right. Other than that, you, you don't. Right. So we're all human flesh. Right. Yeah. Even the. I want to talk about your son. Woo! Mercy. Happy birthday, Jr. Today is his birthday. Today's his birthday. That's so, why I took this date. Oh, I really? knew it would touch all of us. Well, I want you to talk about him, and I want yeah. you to. You, you lost just for people that don't know. Yeah. You, you you lost a son at age 29 from leukemia. Mm -hmm. um, unimaginable for most yeah. people to think about losing a child. Yeah. T walk us through the, that. Yeah. that. Um, imagine if, I, if, if you could, if I took this ink pen and shoved it through the center of your soul and your body and your physical thing and your brain and your mind and your emotions and your faith and everything you believed in life and threw it out and I left that sitting there, what would be left? That's how I feel. And I'm trying to pastor a church. I'm trying to be a chaplain. I'm trying to be a husband. I'm trying to be the, the father to my surviving daughter. I'm trying to be a friend. I'm trying to be an upstanding citizen. I'm trying to get not be na mad at my racist neighbors who call me out of my name. I'm trying to not be mad at the police who pull me over just because I'm driving my black. And then deal with the emotions of losing your child. And they say, he didn't snap. Uh. So when we say what makes a person snap, take any one of those things, you can snap. Right. And then you put all those things together. I'm in the pulpit. Praise the Lord. My heart is like, Lord, you let me down on that one, Doc. We need to talk. Come down here. Let's talk about that boy. Yeah. Why you take that one? I can tell you about 10 people on my church board I wish you would take today. <laughs> And he got he got four of them now, you know that should so. <laughs> that's the reality. It's my baby. So if you make this, so that's why, and that's the love of God. God sent His only Son to deal with us. Yeah. That's the beauty of it, and that's when I got to the point where 
I, I, me and, I had the Lord in a headlock, and I had him too. He was down for the count. The Lord said, okay, I'm tapping out, Chuck. And then the Lord said, Chuck, I took care of your son. I, I, I took care of my son. I'll take care of yours. And I'm like, oh, you, yes, yes, sir, you got me. Yeah, you're right. You did take care of your son, so my son is in your hands. So we're good. High five. Match over. He said, now go on and finish my work, boy. Wow. Well, you got to finish the work. Work still got to be done. I don't care what you lose. How many paraplegics you know still got to go to work? Lose an arm. Lose, lose an arm. You still got to go to work. Got to go to work. How long, how, how long was the process of him when you, he was diagnosed with leukemia to when he passed? Uh, two weeks after we were assigned to pastor here. <laughs> right? Oh, really? So we were assigned to pastor here, and we were, so originally I thought I'd, I, so Bishop called us into the office and said, we want you to go pastor a church. We got two choices, Bakersfield, I, and I had buddies in Bakersfield. I, I love Bakersfield or Santa Barbara. And my wife kicks me, boom, Santa Barbara. Because it's like, um, uh, what's the old show with Zsa Zsa Gabor? Oh, right. And uh, yeah, Green Acres. Right. That's what it would have looked like. My wife is a very classy lady. And um, she kicked me and said, well, you better go to Santa Barbara. And we get to Santa Barbara and I'm pastoring this beautiful church. I'm going to do everything, make a whole community better. And my son gets diagnosed. He, the two years going into it, he gets, you know, ex, you know, extreme chemo, they bring him back, and he, boom, he goes through it. He's a champ. He's a, he's a champ. He's a good-looking, strong guy like me, right? You would expect that, the heart of a champ. And, he's, you know, he comes through two years uh, after that, and he's doing well. He returns to work, and he's doing well. So we had a two-year cycle of the hospital, learning how to navigate the chemo issues and how to, I don't wish that on anybody, man. You know, it's a struggle, right? Uh, you become a doctor, <laughs> yeah. right? You learn to, so anyhow, and, and then you watch him recover. And then the, the, the crazy part about cancer survivors, now they know they can beat anything. So he was like, Shh, dude, dad, I beat that. So I protected him from gangbangers, from crips, thugs, bloods, sluts, tramps, bad cops, crooked cops, drugs. I protected him from all that. I could not protect him from cancer. So now I gotta watch him suffer and die. He gets a meteor, he goes back to work. He's doing well and he gets a mediocre cold and his immune system is so corrupted, it just it racks him down. So he goes back from 200 pound beefy guy, like, you know, looking good to, he's just sucked away in a few months. And then you can just see the writings on the wall. My baby's gonna go. So I look at it like as having four years to say goodbye. Because there are those parents that get that phone call. Right. Hello, Mr. E. Yes. Uh, you know Charles Jr.? Yeah. Uh, you can come identify the vehicle. We can't even find a body. So what is that like? Yeah. So you have to, you know, you have to look at it. You have to put, you know, sister, sister a, a child that I taught in swim team whose body was flushed away in the flood was just recovered. Think about that mother who's battling with the loss of a child. And I can't even find him. Yeah. I can't even, I, there was no goodbye. Yeah. So you have, to, you, have to, you have to look at it like, oh, I had four years to say goodbye. We, we did his, uh, I had a beer with him, I had a drink, we talked about stuff, we threw elbows, we shot basketball, we played jump, we did some sea walking together, we had a good time. I had four years to say, hey son, I'll see you when I get there. Yeah. Yeah. Clear a space for me, I know where you'll be at. Right. Get a space, but you still don't want to give up your baby boy. Oh. You know, you don't want to do that. Death is just such an unnatural thing when you think about it because we weren't made to die. I mean, we, you know, that that parting, that the goodbye. Can I call a timeout? Yeah. Yeah. No, I disagree. The Lord told us that. He said, get ready. He told us to be ready for that interchange in the blink and twinkling of an eye. He told us to get ready. It's going to go down. You know, I, this, this, is, this has got to go. I love this sweatshirt. This is one of his sweatshirts. <laughs> right? Sooner or later, the threads will wear out. Yeah. Sooner yeah. or later. It'll bleach out yeah. sooner or later. True. Yeah. yeah. And so you have to look at it that way, man. Yeah. Sooner or later, that old eggshell and that old shell that you, yeah, it looks good. You're a very sexy guy right now. Right, of course. But sooner or later, Doc, you're going to be. Right. 
and that shell gonna break. That egg was good though. Even this pink tie's gonna wear out? Good. No. I think pink ties are <laughs> eternal. I think that's it lives forever. Yeah, only a bold man like this shirt. Only, only the, well, those yeah. who are bold in the Lord. Right. So you're holy. These bold. colors are who yeah. we are. We're yeah. bright. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, how much time do we have? Do you have a lot of time? We got ten minutes. But show me your books. What do you got <laughs> for me? You so, got books. So I have more questions, but I, I, I know you time. do. And so, like I told you in the in the when we when you did my show, yeah, I told you it was it was part one of a thirteen part series. <laughs> Right, and That's so right. and so you've been doing this. This is part, yeah. and so the 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 crazy. I'm not a I'm not prophetic. I just see things. And when I met you, I said this dude's gonna go. That's yeah. what I saw. And now here I am. Now Appreciate I'm on your show. It. Yeah, here we are. And so how many more? You got a bigger wingspan. I'm just a little chicken. I, I was barely getting off the ground, but you're flying with the big birds. You know. Right, this guy. right, and so that's the kind of you know, and so I, you know, I just, it's 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 more amazing than little old Chuck, and so here I go, you're talking about when I was a kid, seven, seventy eight, seventy nine, yeah, yeah, and this hand right here, this is a blessed hand. This hand has, it's it's a magical hand, and this hand was able to touch a whole lot of kids and say, hey man, you're magic because of this hand. Nineteen seventy nine. Oh. No way. 1979, because I thought somebody told me I was a big man. I went to a big man's camp. I was the smallest guy there. <laughs> Something said, keep your day job. And I started coaching kids. And in coaching those kids, I took a group of my kids to see that guy play. And they took that picture of me no shaking way. Magic Johnson's I hand. Can I see that? Yeah. So when you have your program, and, and it's, the, the cover's getting ready to fall off. It's like going to disintegrate. It's, it's very old. Oh, no, really, it's really fragile. It's going okay, like, to I got it. I got it. I so got that's it. me and magic. This is you right here? And, uh -huh, and so that's, this is a magic hand. Because I told my kids, I would high five. You got the magic touch. You got the, and they would go out and they would play. That, yeah, Chuck, we have the magic touch. And he signed this. And he signed it. But this was, he signed like eight, ten years later when I had to finally catch up. Because once he became famous. That's his first year. His first just, year, 79. Yeah, he was, he, I was nobody. He was just a he was young, coming, young, young buck. Young buck from Michigan. Now look at him. How great is that? Right? Yeah. So we don't know who we touch. Yeah. Right. Now, did, did, I, did I make him great or did he make me great? That's a great question. I'm still coaching kids, and every day I touch them, bless them in the name of the Lord, and they swim faster. And I've been doing this. You guys, now that you're swimmers, look out for those who may be in trouble. Look out for the smaller ones who may be drowning. Because one of those children may be in trouble. It may be drowning, it may be shooting up. Yeah. It may be whatever. Yeah. And that's what I've been doing since that picture was taken. How great. Blessing those children. You can't do that in the church. Because church folks think they know the Bible. They think they know it. But you can do you can spark some stuff in a child with a magic touch. I hold my hand up high. Give me five. I can't touch it. Try. Jump. Reach. Set your goals high. Don't set your goal down there. They said you can't do nothing. But you can do all that plus. You could be magic. You could be Wizard Kelly. Greatest ball player in the world. Who? Wizard Kelly. You never heard of Wiz Wizard no. Kelly? Do your research, Wizard Kelly. Wizard Kelly. Wizard Do you play Kelly. the league? Or you... He's a, he was a cartoon character. <laughs> That's why he's the greatest in the world. <laughs> so he didn't play in the league. <laughs> yeah. Wizard Kelly. Wizard Kelly. That's genius. What else you got? Um, just th that in my word, and then and then and then I have you know because the Bible, the Bible has all the stuff that I I I want to do one day. What's your favorite verse or passage? Uh, Let brotherly love continue. Can Hebrew thirteen. That? Can I see that thing? That, that's my preaching Bible. It is. Yeah, uh, Hebrew thirteen. And when I got in town, they said, "Don't use that that Bible because it's too small." It is a and little they, small. And they I got mad at glasses. Me. Yeah. I said, yeah. but hey, the word is powerful. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. come back void. Never. Yeah. My favorite verse, mm -hmm. Colossians 1, 13 mm -hmm. and 14. Uh, your translation is a little different. Mm -hmm. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness mm -hmm. and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. Redemption's a powerful thing, isn't it? Yes, it is. You've probably seen lots of stories of redemption in yes. your work. Yes, yes. Is there anything better than 
an old guy becoming new, uh, addict becoming free, uh, racist becoming lo loving. A is is there anything more? Can, can I quote you from the book of Chuck? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. You're quoting me? Uh, yeah, this, I'm quoting you from the oh, book oh, of Chuck. You talked about all those people. Yeah. This is your quote. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the nerd closer nerd. I get to God, the bigger he gets. Ah, yes. That's right. And I've worked on that. And they work on that. Oh, that's wonderful. Isn't that, that great? That's what it's about. You know where I thought of that? As we were in Washington, <laughs> D.C., driving near the Washington Monument. Yeah. And we were way far away. I mean, yeah. all the kids. And the closer we got to it, yeah. the bigger it got. And I was like, you know, this is interesting. God in real time. Yeah. That book in real time. Right. Revealed to you. Right. That's what it does. You and this is alive. Real time. This is real alive. time. Yeah. That's and I'm, right. I'm, I'm speaking your words. Thank you. Well, that's great. Echoing, echoing, echoing. Yeah. Your words. Yeah. Thank so think you. of a, if I can if I can capture your words, how many children children will your words touch? Oh my God. This is like a party, isn't it? Cheers. Should we toast? Oh, I love you, the man. The Good Life, Pastor Chuck. Thank you for joining us. This has been Good Life with Pastor Chuck. <laughs> Thank you, brother. We'll see you next time. <laughs>
And, yeah. and then he, and then after you left for Westmont, then yeah. he ended up going to Azusa? Right, right. He, okay. I think 90, I was at Westmont. He was never at Westmont while I was at West, I mean, never at Azusa while I was at Westmont. Okay. I think 91 was his first year at Azusa. I graduated okay. Westmont in 89. Okay, okay. So I can remember I played my very last game at Westmont. We lost in the district uh, tournament and got a ride from from an old friend, Garrett O'Hara, from our game, our Westmont game, to the LA Sports Arena to watch my dad win the CF Championship. Is that right? Yeah, so wow. that was a special. Did he night. have a preference? Did he, what did he like? I mean, I'm sure it's a hard question to answer, but it was a high school coaching experience for him versus the, the college coaching experience? Did he have a preference in terms of the 20 years and high school or at Milken versus the 16 years? Of yeah, I think it was, you know, he, he, he and my mom treated that as their ministry and, you know, really serving uh, youth. And so um, obviously Milliken being a public school was very different in that, you know, what, what you could do. And then you go to Azusa and at this Christian right. school and it was very, you know, you could, could be very upfront about right. things and talk right. about things that way. So it was very different. Very different. Yeah. And I would say, um, you know, he has great relationships with with athletes that he coached at both places. In fact, he just went to last year, had a big gathering of a group of guys from the 70s at Milliken, and they met at a Laker game in a box. And uh, it was really? just one of those things that when you're a retired coach, it was such a blessing Doesn't for get him. Doesn't get better than that. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, but the, yeah. Zusa, the Zusa relationships, because you get four years with them, right. And you recruited them and all that. Those right. those relationships are more sort of, you know, lifelong and more day to day like relationships yeah. that he still has. That makes sense. So. And we were talking before we came on about Jeff Rudder, one of your dad's uh, old assistants. Who yeah. I know he's dear friends with. He was one of my high school uh, teammates and good friends. Um, so he was the athletic director at Azusa Pacific as well as the head coach. And for then, a time, yes. For a time, yeah. And then, and then you be, you became the athletic director at Westmont. Correct. And as I was reading for this interview, I was kind of looking at his story and yours, his track record as a AD in terms of the whatever the award is for the GSAC, GSAC all sports, all yeah. sports, and then yours, <laughs> which is no slouch. Um, I think eight eight years in a row or something is what I read that that in, that you've won that award as AD. Yes. And I can't believe it. It's already been eleven years since you've been AD. Yeah, it's That's gone by quick. Very quick. Yeah. yeah. But so tell me about so y your dad coach AD. You were a player. Yeah. You're a businessman, and we'll get to that in a minute. But tell me about what it's been like to be the athletic director at Westmont College, and also what is your vision for the student athlete? Right. There. Right. That's a great, great question. So, so first, interesting, quick story. So the reason I decided to do the AD thing is because I thought it was going to be a cool way to hang out with my dad because he was still the AD at Azusa. Oh, okay. And so the first three years or two or three years I was AD, he was still AD at APU. Okay. In fact, that, that award, the All Sports Award, has been in our family for something like 20 years because he had it and <laughs> that's the first year he was gone we won it and so that's anyway amazing. so yeah so we we laugh about that so someday fantastic. somebody will get it from is there us. a trophy yeah it's a there's a the it's a odell's really cool just own that trophy. yeah it's, it's, it's it. it goes that's to really... each school and it's wow. funny because it has azusa 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 and then it says westmont 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 wow westmont. it's pretty cool that is awesome. so anyway so we had a blast um being in these business meetings, you know, right. for the conference together, right. and uh, and he taught me so much just to do that job, and yeah. uh, and so I was always able to bounce. And then when he retired, it was even better because I could bounce a lot of things off of him. Oh, but, right. right. Yeah, our our vision for athletes at Westmont is that they have a life changing experience through athletics, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and we believe that you know the the all the pillars of Westmont that you know this this liberal arts education where you've got to do all that and there's no free ride for athletes at Westmont uh, right. as it relates right. to academics and you got to play a sport at a really high level and practice and that time commitment right. and you got to you got to spend time to 
nurture your faith and all the things that Westmont brings in that regard. Right. And, and so we, we see sort of the final product after four years as this super well-rounded person that's had some, had some challenges, had some adversity, mm-hmm. had to dig in and do a lot of things well. Right. Um, and, uh, and we think that that, that experience really has an, has an impact on them. And you, and you know that as much as anybody. Uh, yeah, well, it was a great experience for me. I was not a good baseball player and it took up a lot of time. So I retired, <laughs> but it was, but the Westmont experience is phenomenal. For people that don't know or are watching this somewhere else, Westmont College is a private Christian college in the hills of Santa Barbara, California, 1,200 or so students with an outstanding everything, in my opinion. Um, and I'm not just saying that because Gail Beebe is going to be here in a couple of weeks. Oh, okay. I mean it. <laughs> it's an outstanding, and our family has been blessed by Westmont a lot. But you've won a lot. It's interesting in that answer, winning didn't come up, and I know you, you want to win, mm-hmm. but the other stuff is more important. And so how have you managed to win so much? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so um, we, we think that winning is, is a great metric for how we're doing. Um, if we're doing things well, we're going to win games. Um, one of the first things I did being a business guy is I... I created this giant spreadsheet and I I wanted to see what our win losses were as an entire program all sports and uh, when I became AD we'd won 41 percent of our contests the previous year um, and uh, we started instituting some changes a wide range range of changes and uh, like what uh, well, we did a number of things. We, well, you know, initially there were some coaching changes right, um, right away. Right. Um, we, uh, we instituted um, a captain's retreat that, um, where we sort of poured into the captains and helped them, mm. you know, do that job well. Right. Um, Great idea. Uh, so that was important. We, we started a tradition of an all-athlete meeting uh, where we pulled all the athletes together um, every year we pick uh, a verse of the year um, mm. and a theme for the year around that we want the whole program to adopt um, as as all 250 athletes, not just team by team. Yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, and we really talked a lot about each team supporting other teams. So we came up like with brother sister teams. Mm. Um, we did some things like that, and and we got. Um, we got each team cheering for each other yeah. and feeling like part of something bigger than just their 12 guys on a basketball floor or 30 guys on a baseball field, right. um, that they actually had could have an impact on how the school did in total. And so I, I told my coaches, I said, I don't care where the wins come from. They can come from women's soccer, men's basketball. I just want wins. And so if, if, if your program is going to get wins, that's you know, that's showing me that the metric is right. And if you're doing it in the right way, of course. Right. right. So uh, that first year we won 41%. Uh, the, the first year we won, like, we're right at where we were before. It was a rough first year. And then it just started creeping up. And uh, so now it's interesting because we're always flirting around 75%. Really? Yeah. And the last probably three, four years we've been in the 75% range across all sports. Um, obviously, That's you can't amazing. take into account track cross country because they don't do head to head stuff. But but you're pretty uh, good in track. Uh, yeah, but those track? are good too. So yeah, Russell Smelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow. Uh, so anyway, so that that kind of focus on the full program versus these little siloed things. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah, I think so. You kind of impact. viewed it as a as one collective program. Yeah. Not individual teams. Correct. That's really yeah. smart. I think our coaches also appreciated that. And there's a great camaraderie within the staff. Um, Is there? And they support each other. And now that we have some, some older coaches and some younger coaches, that relationship, those are really cool relationships that are developing. And, and That's uh, really good. Yeah. So there's a lot of like like informal mentoring that are going on right now in the program. So it's, wow. it's great. 
And Dave Wolf still there? Dave Wolf is still there and won a, won a conference championship last year. And, yeah. And how many, know. is he 32 years or something? I think it's it's in that range. I've lost, yeah. He and Smelly, I've lost count. Smelly's of a, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah I, he might be in triple digits. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know where so, exactly. Smelly's. A, and what a, you mentioned the name Russell Smelly to people. It's amazing yeah. the, the, what people just, the respect he's earned over time oh, yeah. and the impact he's had. And, and, and Dave Wolf and John Moore and, and of course, uh, Coach Ruiz has just taken the baseball program now and lit it on fire. Yeah, that um, I tell a lot of people that Rob Ruiz, who was my first hire, um, made me look. Was he like, really? Yeah, he made me look like, <laughs> like a genius. genius. <laughs> because right. you know that well, you program. Got him from Azusa, right? <laughs> and, well, so that's the thing is all I did to get him was I picked up the phone and said, "Dad, I need a baseball coach," <laughs> and he said, "I got a baseball coach for you." Is and that he, right? Because he was the associate head coach at Azusa. Oh, he wasn't the head coach. He was the associate head coach. Yeah, under Paul Sfagdis, who's still there. Oh, okay. Uh, but your dad knew about him. Uh, well, yeah, because he, yeah, he worked in, under my dad, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so my dad said, yeah, Robert's ready for a head coaching job. And uh, we had a full search, but he, you know, he nailed it. Yeah, and, he was the one. Yeah, he's the one. And, and, and he's, he's really progressed. Um, he's helping me with athletic administration. I really lean Is on he really? him. Uh, in the AD stuff, he handles a number of things that, given my roles, I, I can't get to. Right. Um, but he does it so well, and that's and great. Just so you started one for one in the head coaching <laughs> yeah. deal. Yeah, that's great. I also lit the baseball program on fire, literally. You did. Can I tell you a quick story? Okay. So we did this. We decided to go down to the baseball field at night, uh -huh. um, and douse baseballs in gasoline. Put them on the tee and then hit them. Okay. Seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Yes. <laughs> well, Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> right. So I was a freshman. Uh, again, freshman on the team. Not a good player. No power at all fields. Um, how, how I've described my hitting. So I I am in charge of the gas can. And somehow I got like way too close, and the fire went this way. Uh oh. So we had like a. A big problem. Security arrives. We go bolting in like six different directions. I just remember jumping some fence, like in the right field, down the right field line. So I lit the baseball program on fire, also. Yeah. Like Robert. You did. Just in a different way. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Was, was who? Was that was the coach? highlight of my baseball career. Was that Kirkgaard night. your coach? Kirkgaard was my coach. Okay. The great John Kirkgaard, who yeah. I'm still good friends with to he's this day. He's a great guy. Legendary, he, wonderful man. He's been so supportive of Robert. I Has think he? that that's. That's had a huge impact on our program too. Oh, it's just great. the support that we still get from John. He's that's, so loved. And so is. I, when I was playing basketball at Westmont, all my buddies were baseball players who played for Kirkgaard. Oh, really? So I went to every baseball game. So I love John. Yeah, too, John so. Kirkgaard's a great guy. Yeah. Let's talk about John Moore. Okay. So John Moore retired, yeah. and, and he's 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 finished as the head coach, and he's he, my understanding is he's moving kind of into an associate athletic director. Or he may stick around right in some capacity, but reflect on his career. And yeah. I know you guys have been friends a long time. And yeah, reflect so, on that. So so. I, I actually grew up, I had seen John play high school and oh, really? uh, at Los Alamitos. Because your dad? Well, yeah, because we, Los Alamitos, where John played, is actually really close to Millican. And so, oh, really? yeah, so I had an occasion to see he and his, and his brother Mike play uh, in their years at Los Alamitos. Oh, nice. So, I didn't know um, that. And, then, um, and then I watched John play at Westmont because uh, we used to go to the local Westmont games. And then okay. John coached at Fresno when I played for Chet Cameron oh, at really? Westmont. And so, yeah, a lot of years with John. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, I think there's a couple things that, I mean, there's so many things, but there's a couple things that really stand out to me about John is just, one, his, his relationship with the community. And mm -hmm. I don't mean just the Westmont community. For, for one, he's loved by the professors. Um, and he's a coach that just really embraced that faculty coach model mm. and uh, really, I think, uh, helped the athletic department and helped me as an AD in terms of credibility with the faculty because there's always a little bit of tension right, between right, athletics right. and the faculty. Right. And uh, John, I think, was instrumental in sort of 
bridging that. Russell's another guy who fits in that category. Right. But um, so I would I would say that. And then you know, some of the things that you know really I think West Westmont stands where it does in this community in terms of the greater Santa Barbara community because of John's interaction with the community. And um, I don't know if you followed the Santa Barbara Athletic yeah. Roundtable. Yeah, yeah. But, but John is, they always have John be the last guy to speak at that lunch during basketball season. And he goes every Monday and, um, and he just represents the college so well right. in that environment. Yeah. And like the, the, you know, people just eat it up, but he also does a great job of sharing what's special about Westmont mm -hmm. to, to the greater Santa Barbara community. Right. And if I had to pick one thing that I just think you know, we'll go beyond what he accomplished as a coach and what he accomplished with certain players and so forth. It would be that he he really did um, sort of help Westmont. I mean, when you think about it, he's he outlived a lot of presidents at Westmont. Right. And so his right. name and face in the community um, was the Westmont coach. Yeah. And right. so what a great ambassador he was for all these years yes. in that regard. So true. Yeah. So true. We, he was he was here a few weeks ago. We had a great time talking, reflecting, and talking about. Course, I loved that episode oh, because I loved when you threw out names and he was right, like right, coming right, up with each one. Right, that right. was good. That well, was and good. then the Jeff A's. I mean, he almost brought me to tears. I mean, I'm just talking about A's. I mean, 26 years together. Yeah. And just that story. That's just such a powerful story of, uh, you know, on A's's part of kind of just servant. Yeah, servant's heart. Yeah, and just the way that they, you know, love each other. It's yeah. powerful. Yeah. Well, so that's all on the Westmont athletic director side. I want to talk about your 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 career. I want to talk about. Well, let's start with Medbridge. Okay. And um, w when I was, you know, here years and years ago, it was it was, it was always Dave O'Dell was associated with the Tining Group. Mm -hmm. That was the name in my head. And yeah. Now it's Medbridge, but. Tell us, I, I read a little bit about MedBridge, but for somebody who's watching, what, what does MedBridge do? Right, so, so what we do is we partner with um, surgeons, uh, physicians that, that specialize in surgery, and we develop and then part, partner with and develop and manage outpatient surgery centers. So, oh. um, so imagine a doctor you know, needing to do your ACL reconstruction because you blew out your knee playing basketball. Um, most of my centers are, are orthopedic in nature, so my partners are mostly orthopedic surgeons. You've probably heard of Dr. Ryu right. locally, yep. um, is a well-known surgeon. Yep. So I did my first surgery center in Santa Barbara at uh, called Summit Surgery Center right across the street from the hospital. And we, we did it because um, the doctors wanted to specialize their surgical environment and instead of going to the hospital where you've got all different kinds of specialties going on and you might be doing a you know a hernia repair at eight o'clock and at nine o'clock an ACL and at ten o'clock some heart procedure right they wanted to be able to specialize huh. and they wanted to be able to buy the highest tech equipment they wanted their staff in the operating room the tech the circulating nurses to be specialized in what they did. So it was at the time, this was, you know, late 90s, there were only 400 surgery centers in America and now they're 5,000. Is that right? And, um, and in fact, um, Medicare has really leaned on the surgery center industry to, to reduce the costs in the Medicare system. Oh. So um, in fact, over the last couple of years, we're now doing uh, total joints in an outpatient setting um, for Medicare patients. Wow. And, uh, and we've, we've played an instrumental role during the pandemic because, you know, surgeries haven't been able to get done in the hospital because they've been saving oh, right. beds. Right. So COVID. we've actually been taking on more cases at the surgery center. Wow. Um, and so, so my, my company, MedBridge, we, we put together the doctors who partner together. We develop the surgery centers and then we hire the staff and we manage it. So we do all the business function, all the billing and the collections and all the Medicare certification, all the state and federal guidelines following. And then the surgeons just 
schedule surgery. their cases and they do their surgery. And wow. um, from a business model standpoint, we get a facility fee, just like the hospital would get a fee. Yep. And it's an opportunity for the doctors to make a little more money because they're partners in the entity. So they- the Doctors who work there are partners in the business. Exactly. That is the surgery center. Exactly. So instead wow. of just making their professional fee, right. they get a little cut of the profit of the surgery center. Wow. Um, and so it, um, it's really interesting because as reimbursements have dropped, meaning doctors are getting paid less now yep. than they ever have, yep. um, they are really relying on these ancillary revenues like, like outpatient surgery. So wow. um, anyways, the other cool thing about it is, Dr. Ryu is a great example. He used to say, you know, I would get done with my operative day at eight o'clock and be happy if I got home to see my kids because of the backups that happen in a hospital with triage cases that need to get put on. And once we opened the surgery center, he was done by two every day. And wow. it allowed him to have a little more balance in his life, you know, yeah. and, and wow. all that. So um, interesting. So that's the business. Um, we have 15 different surgery centers that we are partners in or provide services to across California. Um, and they're, but they're not called MedBridge. The, they're the they're all named separate entities. Okay. They all have different ownerships. We're the we're the sort of the operating group. I see. And we're owners in most of them, and so uh, yeah, it's a it's an interesting business and and uh, one that I sort of stumbled into. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you how how did that happen? Well, so I'm a CPA by trade, right. uh, so I had gone that route, and you know about switching careers. <laughs> yeah, I do. You know, uh, I did love it. Um, and uh, John Tynan, my current partner, uh, asked me to come help him with Tynan Group, which he had just started. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that we did was we bought a building by, by the hospital just as an investment, and it happened to be occupied by a number of orthopedic surgeons. Oh. And they, so I was their landlord. And they came and they said, we'd love for you to build us a surgery center. And I said, what's that? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and they explained it to me. I said, okay, let's try it. And so I did one and I thought, okay, we'll just go back to our knitting. And, and, uh, yeah. and then about a year and a half later, I got a call from a very prominent Bay Area surgeon named Eugene Wolf, um, who actually was probably the first, uh, the, he's sort of known for a particular knee and shoulder procedure. Um, asked me to develop his surgery center, and then it kind of just snowballed from wow. there. Wow, and you have 15 now. Yeah, yeah. And they're all in California? They're all in California. We have one um, that we're working on out of state um, right now, but but really focused on California, just because I, I never wanted to have to take two planes to get anywhere. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> so we have a Bay Area presence, but pretty much everything is down here. Down we have here. three in the surgery. In the, in the that area. is really interesting. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about culture, uh -huh. just in companies and anywhere. Yeah. What's it, what have you learned? You've been in business a long time. You've been an athletic director a long time now. Um, what have you learned about culture in a workplace in a that is important to you? Yeah, that's a great question, and and that I think um, what what uh, employees. Um, expect from a culture from a company is very different today than it even was five years ago mm -hmm. um, so we're constantly sort of evolving mm -hmm. as it relates to culture um, I think that one thing that is for sure and and I think long-term wise is I've tried to build um, culture around service mm -hmm. everything I that I've been involved with professionally has been about making the people that we serve better and able to focus on their trade, whether it be Dr. Marcus Elliott at P3, mm -hmm. um, helping him be able to spend more time in the science of sports, mm -hmm. helping uh, Dr. Ryu be able to spend more time in surgery where mm -hmm. he really is helping patients versus administrative right. things, whether it, it's keeping my coaches with their athletes right. and on the floor coaching them versus having to do other administrative tasks that you know so so i've sort of built the focus of my cultures around service yeah and um but i think that 
the 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 big thing that needs to happen in culture, whether it be an athletic program or a business, is creating um, meaning around what what mission is and what what each person that shows up, how what they're doing helps others, changes the world, changes their community. Mm -hmm. It gives them something more than am I just doing this for a paycheck? Right. Or if I just doing this for another trophy, um, right. more around like what are, what am I doing for humanity yeah. or the kingdom or you right. know, what have you? Right, that's beautiful. Yeah. And what you described before, have you read Good to Great? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, it, you want Dr. Ryu spending the time, spend as much time as possible doing the things that only Dr. Ryu can do. Yep. You know, which is not paperwork. Exactly. <laughs> which it seems exactly. like, I mean, it's, it seems obvious, but that's a very brilliant thought I mean, in terms of getting people in the right seats yeah. and then thrive. And they're going to thrive. Right. I mean, when they're, they're going to be happiest. Right. And I know, and in, in going back to what you said about service, I, I do know about the, the MedBridge project at the Boys and Girls Club or... I've heard, I've heard about, you, have you done service projects? Yeah, as a, as a company, we've done a number of service projects, a couple really neat things um, through Partners in Education, okay. which I'm a yeah. member of the board of. Oh, um, are you really? And we, uh, we, we've done some tutoring for at the, at the junior high as a staff, so we give them an hour every other week to go sit and tutor at the junior high. Oh, that's um, so good. We've transitioned from that to been doing some things at Harding Elementary School okay. um, as a company. And, and so, you know, we, we do something around uh, Martin Luther, Luther King Day every mm. year um, as a company just to focus on service and oh, that's so try great. to impact um, things. So, so those also, those shared, uh, you know, kind of missional things yeah. mean a lot to uh, the employees of today. Right, so, right. Yeah. And it also helps knit you together. It does. I mean, it I does. would think. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Your wife is Deanna. Yes. Walker, Rainey, and Rally. That's is that it. right? Yes. And they're all out of the house? Are they? They are. They are. Wow. In various stages, the, the two daughter, my two daughters are in college. They're both soccer players. One's at Point Loma, one's at UC Santa Barbara. Really? And so with COVID, they're kind of... Oh. been back and forth okay. Um, okay. and so uh, it's been it's actually been a blessing to go from empty nester to kind of uh, not empty nester anymore we were like right. empty nesters <laughs> right. for about a three month just period. when you were getting used to it yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Right, right. but it's been such a I mean that's been one of the blessings about this whole pandemic one of the few is that we've got to spend more spend time, time that we wouldn't right. have thought we got to have oh that's great well Dave yeah. you got a great family you've you're a great part of the community here and in, bo in both of your roles i'm not sure how you manage where do you office did you office at westmont yeah you? no um we bought a building right before the funk zone became the funk zone oh in really the funk zone so uh oh, really? so, so that's right, where you are yeah so we have a three-story building and we have uh my office with john tynan and tynan group is on the third floor the okay. second floor is all medbridge and then uh the lab our business the lab which is a sort of a, a partnership with P3 and Elite Physical oh. Therapy, where we train um, adults who, you know, just really want to get back into doing physical stuff. Okay. Um, and we use that's on the, the bottom floor. That's on the bottom floor. The lab. The lab. Do you do any training for 14 year old aspiring basketball players like we, my son? The, those go to P3. Okay. So we do that at P3. Okay. Um, we call the lab p3 for civilians so when luca was at the p3 yeah he used to come up come to the lab to recover okay. um but uh but then uh, so many adults like you and me said i want what luca's got and right. we said well you can't come here because this is where the pros come <laughs> right. um, but you okay. can come to the lab ah. but but our aspiring younger athletes go to go to p3 go to p3 yeah okay so that's where young yeah. people would go right I don't even know if Luca qualifies as a human being anymore yeah no, I think he may have ascended to a different level I don't know that shot the other night yeah Luca that's playing on one ankle 21 year old <laughs> yeah crazy. he started coming to p3 at 16 did he really so oh, we, I didn't know uh, yeah he would come out there and and the so the, that's a success story it's an interest yeah Marcus and his team does a wonderful job with these with these guys and and we always get asked, like, why is he so good? And it's it's always the, it's the same answer as James Harden. It's that ability to decelerate. Um, mm. Luca, you know, when he does that 
yeah. dribble, step back. Right. You know, the, 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 the force and speed at which he does it really sets him apart. And it's amazing. Uh, so it's he's amazing. Quite, a, quite an athlete. Yeah, skill set we don't have. Right, <laughs> right, right. Dave, thanks for coming by. I'm sure we'll have you on again. Thanks, uh, Sometime down the road. This but has been great. Great talking with you. Good and we'll see you next time.